Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian. We recently traveled to Norfolk, Virginia to visit NATO's Allied Command Transformation Headquarters to cover the command's annual Chiefs of Transformation Conference. It's one of the leading gatherings of innovative minds from across the Alliance. There, we caught up with General Denis Mercier, the Supreme Allied Commander of Transformation, where we asked him to discuss the themes and priorities for this year's conference. NATO is in the midst of a cycle of political, military, and institutional adaptation, primarily driven by the fast-moving security environment that affects us beyond the borders of the North Atlantic area. While executing the mainly short-term measures decided in Warsaw and mentioned by the Deputy Secretary General, we also need to focus on the longer term. This urges for our transformation efforts to share future or longer term tendencies and to expand them to our partners, in, including the European Union. Because it is no longer a choice, but a necessity to base today's decisions on shared future perspectives. Uh, the theme of this year's conference is uh, if we prepare the future, we need to share it, share this future. And, uh, uh, you know, we are in a very changing environment, and uh, what I see is uh, to adapt to this changing environment, many nations, allied nations, partner nations, working on new innovation initiatives, they prepare their own, uh, own future. And this is absolutely important that we share those ideas in order to build first the interoperability and see how we can benefit from all those, uh, uh, all those initiatives. So this is the purpose of the conference, is share this future. I'm very proud to see that uh, we are 51 nations today participating in this conference. We have partner nations from Asia, from Africa, from South America, from Europe, together working with the Allies. We have Center of Excellence, we have the European Union, and, uh, and, and you know, this is, this is the best demonstration that when we work together, we can uh, build a better future. The first thing, uh, when we are talking about the technical interoperability, we are developing in NATO a standard which name is Federated Mission Networking. This is, a very, this is the same standard that the, the US side is developing on their own. And this standard of interoperability is, if you are compliant with this standard, you can come with your national system, you plug them, you, 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 you plug it, and, uh, and then uh, this system will exchange information with the others. So this is a spiral approach. We are working hard on that. But this is one piece of it. The second piece of it is, again, uh, how we recognize the future technologies and how we bring uh, the uh, technological awareness uh, necessary uh, to inform our stakeholders to make the right decisions. Because I, uh, I, I, I was in an exercise uh, very recently, an experimentation conducted by the US, and, uh, and we were looking at digital fires. How can we do that together? And, and I mentioned those guys, so I see it's working. So uh, what prevents us from, from deploying that in, in, uh, in the uh, end and forward presence today? And they said, on the technical part of it, we, will, we are progressing very quickly. The problem now, is we need to do cross-domain, different level of classification, and the problem now is a political problem. But, but we need to explain the technology, explain the problem, and then ask our stakeholders to say, this, this are these are the decisions you need to make now in order to be able to work together. We have many emerging technologies and, uh, and this is why this year we have uh, innovated in the Chief of Transformation Conference instead of uh, uh, doing panels as we did before. Uh, we have only syndicate sessions, and we have asked five nations to lead each of the syndicate sessions in order to bring their views on the future and share that with the others. And this is France with capabilities, this is US with human capital, this is UK with command and control, this is Spain with ISR, and this is Germany with logistics. And uh, there are many of other things, but we will start like this, and I expect very tangible outcomes we can work on in the future. The autonomy program is uh, something we uh, wanted to uh, uh, to start because uh, autonomous systems, the technology is uh, mature enough now to uh, bring more autonomy in everything we do, whether it is on the uh, command and control area, whether it is in the capabilities, whether it is in logistics and uh, in many other, other domains. And um, it's very important that uh, we look uh, at uh, what the technology enables us to do and uh, what are the challenges that offers. In, in, and, and the challenges and opportunities. And regarding the challenges, interoperability is one issue, but uh, as I mentioned this morning, uh, the main thing is uh, when we talk about autonomous system, um, 
are, are we sure that all of our nations have, uh, will have the same level of acceptance uh, of, this, uh, of this level of autonomy? And we need, we need to identify this, and we need to set uh, the conditions for developing maybe in the future new, new uh, legal frameworks and everything, and this is really the purpose of it. Share that with all, uh, all of our nations. And, um, and the opportunities as well, because uh, the autonomous system will offer us uh, uh, ways to think differently, and uh, that will probably change the nature of warfare, but that's very important to understand it. And finally, what are the threats uh, that uh, will come from this autonomous system? How, how our potential adversaries, whether they are state or non-state actors, they can use that against us. So it's really time to, uh, to uh, I have a common understanding of this, uh, of these issues, of these challenges and opportunities, and work on this development together. The main issue, and I'm very convinced that in our 21st century, but this is true for the civilian companies, but this is true for defense as well, we have two uh, strategic resources, uh, data and human capital, and how we uh, interface human, uh, human capital with, uh, uh, with uh, digital architectures. And the future capabilities, whether you talk about the future air system, naval system, land systems, the, the key issue will be um, if we raise correctly the problem, will not be a ship, an aircraft, or a tank. The key issue will be what kind of data you, you, you need, what kind of service based on the data you give to your people, sailors, uh, soldiers, airmen, marines and uh, how you collect this data, how you fuse the data, and uh, how you distribute it, and to whom. If we, if we do that correctly, then we will, build, we will build systems differently, but those systems will help delivering the right service to the right guy who will deliver the, uh, the, uh, the action. And this is, this is a change of mindset. And this is what I said, this is what I repeatedly say to my headquarters, I say, uh, maybe in the past we could have said, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. And I, I, I tell them, no, it's over. Today, don't bring me solutions. Raise the problem first and raise it correctly. And, 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 and the first solution you have in mind is likely not to be the good one. You know, NATO has uh, 20, had 24 centers of excellence. We have a 25th now, which is the, uh, the center of excellence built by uh, Italy on uh, on uh, security force assistance. Uh, this is a very important topic. We have seen that in the many theaters of operation we have been engaged in, with. And uh, this center of excellence uh, now is open. And we need to sign this MOU. And uh, this engages Italy, but this engages all the nations that will participate in the center of excellence. And uh, this power of the center of excellence is essential for us. Um, this 25 now center of excellence with a new one, um, they are they, uh, they bring together more one, than 1,000 people, and uh, we use them to develop NATO doctrine. We use them to uh, help us uh, to uh, bring uh, um, uh, uh, expertise in uh, many different areas. We uh, use them to uh, uh, develop lessons learned, and, uh, and uh, they are national centers, but there is an accreditation to NATO. And this one has just been accredited through a long process. So this is, uh, this is uh, very uh, uh, important today to do that officially and to sign this MOU and to declare that this center of excellence now will deliver NATO products. You, you know, we have a process with the, uh, what we call the long-term military transformation. And it starts with a strategic foresight analysis, which is a document we have just uh, updated in total two months ago, and this document uh, um, describes the trends that could lead to a crisis in the future, and what are the main implications, especially at the political level for NATO. Based on this document, we, uh, we, uh, we build the framework for future alliance operations, the document you talked about, and uh, we identify uh, um, uh, instability situation, and, uh, and, uh, and in this document, we try to see what are the military implications. And these military implications are uh, um, um, are focused on the 10, 15, 20, 25 years and see and, and describe what we need to do in order to uh, meet the challenges that we have uh, identified in the strategic foresight analysis. And this is really the basics uh, for the development of uh, our capability process, which is called the NATO Defense Planning Process, sorry, and uh, NDPP. And, uh, and that's, that's very important that we have those documents that shed the future, because as I usually say, it's not to prepare future decisions, 
but this is to, to assess the future of present decisions in order to be sure that what we do today uh, will be relevant in the future as well.